Mr. Nanshin, so before we start off our podcast today, uh, I think we should give a brief introduction to our viewers about um, who you are and uh, what we might be talking about, but let's start off with you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, I'm Nanshin Emmanuel Nansak. I'm a Nigerian. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, particularly, I'm from a place called Lantang. So Lantang is... Um, is from the central part of Nigeria. So I came from a state called Plateau State. Very beautiful. We have quite uh, similar things with Ireland. We grow what we call Irish potato also. All right. <laughs> and we have a very temperate uh, uh, weather. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, basically that's me. Well, thank you for that, Nanshin. And you're very welcome to our podcast today. And before we start off, a quick introduction. I'm Agni. Uh, I'm from India and we share actually more things in common as we were talking about before than Mm -hmm. like I'd like to bring in right now. So I'd be the host. I'm a PhD student as well, just like Nanshin. So and I think this would be the perfect place for us um, to start off on our topic, which is going to be about how it has been the experience as an international for you, as a Nigerian for you. To come to an international land and start off your PhD journeys, your challenges, and we are going to take uh, like a brief um, overlook at it, like and see what you think and what you've experienced so far. So, if you're ready to go, then I'll start shooting right away. Yeah, yeah, very ready. Yeah, I was born ready. All yeah. right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're yeah. starting with that. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. So, so Nanshin, so yeah. can you share your journey of pursuing a PhD in Ireland, um, like, you know, from Nigeria. Yeah. So I would say it's a long way coming, you know, it's not just uh, a one way kind of thing that I just woke up one day and then it happened. Like any other PhD student, um, it was a process, a long process, Uh, had to go through the process and I had to trust the process when I was trying to get the, you know, the, the opportunity. So I did a couple of applications and um, yeah, I never gave up. So here I am and everything is going well uh, for now, I would say. <laughs> and uh, the journey, like any other PhD, can be bumpy. It's not always very smooth. There are days it's kind of come out of your bathroom, like uh, Akime days, shouting Eureka, oh, yes. Eureka. So yes. those Eureka moments are there. <laughs> But you shouldn't expect so much of that, that kind of moment because it's rare. But then, if you keep it 100, I mean, yeah, you always uh, get something out of it. So the journey so far so good mm-hmm. has been bittersweet. Well, all right. So yeah. we'll go off with that then. Bittersweet it is. Yeah. So that leads me to the next question. Why Ireland, like for your doctoral studies, out of so many nations? So, yeah. what made you choose Ireland? Yeah, so to be honest, uh, I would say a couple of things uh, made me to choose Ireland. Uh, one of which is that I Google. So, when I Google, uh, I look at the rankings, like the educational kind of ranking, which is always there, the university ranking and stuff. So I discovered that, oh, Ireland has some of the best uh, educational uh, systems in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I was on this site trying to get some opportunity and I saw this very project that I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was advertised. I was like, you know what? That's it. So just like that, I put in my application a few days to the closing date. In fact, they extended it. That's how I got in. Okay. So yeah, so I, I just applied. I sent my application and they got back to me. And from there, you know how it everything goes in this kind yeah, of thing. I, I so would say I'm familiar. Yeah, so yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it makes me think that I want to ask you, like, how is the academic environment different here in Ireland compared to that in Nigeria? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, it's different. It's different uh, in a way uh, that um, when you look at the educational system in Nigeria and the one in Ireland, 
uh, there is a common denominator. Mm -hmm. the, the common denominator is that we practice almost the same system, like, uh, you, uh, you know, secondary school, then university, mm -hmm. you know, high school, and all mm -hmm. these kind of things. Uh, however, the admission for postdoctoral post studies uh, and then, uh, you know, all these graduate studies, as yeah, Americans yeah, would yeah. call it, the mm -hmm. PhD and all this. Um, in Ireland, you can be admitted with your first degree, you know. Right. Yeah, that is impossible in Nigeria, for example. Okay, okay. You are not going to be admitted for PhD in Nigeria if you do not have a master's degree. Yeah, okay. so this, this is there. And then, um, uh, to be honest, the relationship between the supervisor and the student uh, in Ireland, I would say it's more cordial. Right. Yeah, it's more cordial because uh, there's some level of egalitarianism mm. because the society is more egalitarian, the yes. educational sector, yes. in a yes. way that you don't even have to call the titles when you are addressing your professor or anything. They don't even like the title. Oh, no, they yeah, don't. They you don't can call like them it. by the name. Yeah, so they prefer you call them by the name, the first name and all these things. Mm -hmm. And um, this makes it very, very um, uh, easy for you to communicate and then to express yourself mm -hmm. because there's this uh, deliberate attempt to make you feel that you are a peer. You know, You're so right. that makes you kind of put in your best, mm -hmm. and uh, this this is not the case back home. You know, okay, yeah. Okay. So the, the title is very important. It's, it's not wrong, but mm. yeah. So these are some of the the discrepancies I would say that uh, exist obviously in the two educational systems that have been. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that that gives me a much better picture, much clearer yeah. picture, if I would say so. Yeah. So. Yeah. So let's move on to a slightly different topic, yeah. but something that just came up right now. Yeah. So tell me more about um, your research topic. Like, what's it about? Like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, that's that's that should be the most exciting part of it because mm -hmm. that's why I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, uh, like last time, I think we were in uh, Galway together with yes. you and then uh, Letter Kenny, Donegal, mm -hmm. yeah, County Donegal, yeah. So I am basically working on uh, biodegradable medical devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they are like state-of-the-art kind of medical devices. So um, they want to use polymer, mm -hmm. uh, biodegradable polymers to make these uh, devices. And... Um, what makes these devices uh, kind of different from the one in the market or the one uh, out there is that they are they are expected to be biocompatible they are expected to be biodegradable and mm -hmm. to be non-toxic by extension what i mean is these devices uh, when they are implanted in human body, they they just degrade and disappear in your body without right. any adverse effect, hmm. you know. So, but the challenge with this is uh, to 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 be able to optimize the time hmm. they they're going to spend in your body. So, hmm. uh, they shouldn't kind of disappear before your healing process is done because that would cause some problem, hmm. and they shouldn't be there longer than expected. So, we're just trying to. Uh, model this mathematically and computationally, mm -hmm. you know, come up with mathematical models that will guide and um, help in the design process of, of all these things. So we might carry out some experimentation to verify our models, mm -hmm. you know, to see some prototypes or how this thing can be applied and probably, you know, um, be transitioned into larger market for production or whatever. So, okay. it, yeah. So now that sounds fascinating actually yeah, and I too. can already see the usability and the utility of the whole concept so yeah, yeah. well done to you. Thank you. Right so let's see now comes the harder part actually so oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's why we're doing the podcast yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as an international PhD student, mm. I mean, I personally have found like there's a lot of challenges that you might like, you know, some of them you might expect and there would be countless that you cannot. Yeah. But what according to you, like what kind of challenges have you faced as an international PhD student here? And 
have you overcome them and if so how yeah <clears throat> so i would say the first challenge is uh weather weather and climate <laughs> yeah <laughs> why i'm gonna say that uh is uh, is because uh you know when you first move to a new country a new nation a new town or whatever the first thing that greets you is the weather mm -hmm. the climate before you even start uh, having a conversation with the locals mm -hmm. the weather must have greeted you in a way uh, like in my case for example i remember i moved in the day was uh, the temperature was like 17 16 degrees 17 degree in mm -hmm. dublin mm -hmm. so when i moved in i was shivering you know i never <laughs> i could for imagine this. yeah so i never signed for this oh island <laughs> 17 of course because i'm coming from a very hot uh, region of course yeah so the temperature was very very strange to me uh, but then my body had no option so i had to adapt mm -hmm, you know like mm -hmm. so there's this adaptation that uh, took place naturally mm -hmm. so uh, i'm getting used to it i think today the temperature is nowhere near 17 you know maybe today is 14 or 15 there about or something and you're and yeah and uh, uh, just to make now. it clear for people yeah um we are talking about an irish summer yeah right now so yeah yes yeah so i'm getting used to the to the to the weather i would say uh, day by day um but to me that was the first thing that challenged me i would mm -hmm. say um then the language right yeah what do you mean by the language though because yeah. we all speak english now yeah. don't we yeah now let's get on to that yeah we all speak english and um it it, it would be easy for you to transition from an english speaking country to another speaking english speaking country however these are native speakers so uh, in this case what i'm talking about is the accent right you know right. the accent mm. i do not have problem with the accent i understand the accent very well mm -hmm. and they kind of understand me too yes. but um i have nigerian friends do you mm. understand of course so I do, we, yes. we go to the shop or mm. to the supermarket <laughs> or something to buy yeah. and then when my friends are talking mm -hmm. i see the stress they have to like go through trying to explain whatever they're trying mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. yeah. and um and that is a serious barrier in a way that that can even affect your socialization and all these things that you have to do you know to feel welcome in a place would you also say that it's also uh it also becomes like something of a cultural barrier as well in that sense yeah there's a cultural shock cultural shock is there obviously is 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 it's a major thing you know mm -hmm. um you can go to some nations handshake or like a thumb up mm -hmm. and all these things can be considered offensive <laughs> yes. in some places you know yes yeah so when you move to a new place it is a major decision mm -hmm. and it is a it's, it's a major process of transition that you have to go through whether you like it or not do you understand me of course i yeah. do so the cultural shock is there in every way from the mm -hmm. food from the clothing from the dressing the way of life generally is going to be different from what you're used to of course you understand yeah, me of course yeah so but then language the accent in this case is challenging to quite a lot of uh, uh, people especially those who come from like uh, you know background that are not you know native speakers of course and all yes these yes kind of things yeah Right. So, would you say those were the only challenges you faced, or uh, is there something that you would say that could, like, you know, has been more of a challenge, or maybe dwarfs these yeah. in comparison? Yeah, yeah there, there are challenges. There are other challenges. Another challenge I face would be food. Of course. Yeah, food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as a Nigerian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I like something heavy, you know, the, of kind, course. Of, the kind of food I like, I like something it's heavy. more like yeah. spicier. Yeah, I like this. something like mpang, with course. akri yu, uh -huh. or, uh, or like um, akri luambin, or, uh, or something like, 
ngungumka or nkwatare you would have to explain them because yeah. even though I, I I've, got, I've had Nigerian friends myself but you know they might get lost in translation so. yeah yeah so, so these are like my traditional cultural food yes yeah and I I grew up eating these things you of know course, like of course for almost three decades or whatever so you can imagine coming now and then trying to you know start uh, taking coffee oh, of course <laughs> you know so you're, take, you're not used to that now no way <laughs> no way <laughs> taking coffee or um, what do we call it a sandwich yeah sandwich or burger <laughs> or pizza oh, yeah yeah oh, no yeah. way D- those are no substitute at all to what I was used to. I understand? would imagine, yes. Yeah, so that challenged me a lot. I remember uh, we came in with my friend who who is a Nigerian. Uh, his name is Babatunde. Oh, so yes. Babatunde is from the southwestern part of Nigeria. Mm. I am from the central, like I told you earlier. Mm-hmm. So we were famished. We were famished in a way that we couldn't get the kind of food we want. Right. Do you, do you right. understand? That's we wanted something very good, but uh, good, I mean like something African, that is, you yes, know, kind yes, of, yeah. yeah. So we couldn't get that. So we had to go food hunting. <laughs> yeah. No, kind of how did hunting. that go? <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we use uh, Google, you know, try to search for some rice, you know, jollof rice. Jollof rice, yeah, yes. So we couldn't get jollof rice, but we were able to get like Chinese rice. Okay. So that was a close substitute. Closest, yes. Yeah. So, and then it was our first week. Hmm. We didn't even know the, the, the city, right? Of course yeah, not. So yeah. we're just using Google Map, you know. It's so, a huge yeah. transition at that point. Yeah, and you want some comfort one. in your food, isn't yeah, it? So. Yeah. So we just needed to get something because we were living with David and then uh, we had to like eat sandwich or all these things for three days and it was <coughs> just Excuse going me. out of uh, order for us so we were able to trace uh, this Chinese restaurant you and me okay yeah you and me very close to Tesco okay yeah we were able to trace that I'm still we getting familiar that. with the Sligo map and yeah. the geography so yeah so we got there Okay. We got to you and me, and we ordered uh, takeaway Chinese rice. Okay. Yeah, which was done in form of fried rice, which um, we loved it because when, when we ate that, we felt like at last we've eaten after seventy-two hours. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, That's, that must have been stressful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was crazy. Yeah. Okay. I can yeah. imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. I've I've been there with certain exp- certain of those experiences myself. Yeah. So I can relate. That's all I I'll, I'll say. Yeah. So, I'll move on to. Yeah. So, housing or accommodation? Oh, no, oh. that's a, a whole new, like you know, ball game, isn't it? Crazy. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. So, I remember when we first came in, we had to move in between about two, to three accommodations mm. before we finally kind of settled. In yes. my case, particularly. Yeah. So when we came, um, David, who is like, um, I think the, the lecturer's union chairman or something mm-hmm. there in ATU Sligo, mm-hmm. he took us in. He said, okay, guys, you're going to stay here for three days. Mm. Then <laughs> you have to find You have to somewhere. find your own way. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we stayed with David for three days because some Ukrainians were coming to take over our room in David's place. Okay. Yeah, so um, so I spoke with Marion. Marion is my supervisor. Yes. So Marion called Mahmoud. Mm-hmm. Mahmoud is a PhD student also. Of course. So Mahmoud was having like a single room which was vacant in his place. So he said, okay, I can come over and stay with him. So Mahmoud said, okay, uh, Nanshin, you stay here for 30 days. Mm-hmm. Then you have to find something. But yeah. that is so kind, actually, yeah. for you to even, like, you know, to yeah. have that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I know a so lot of students who have, like, you know, barely been able to get some kind of roof over their head. Yeah. But yeah. I would say that you are lucky in that case. Yeah. Yeah. So I stayed in Mahmoud's place. So while I was staying in Mahmoud's place, I was looking, you know, like, mm. really, really looking, mm. going to students' accommodation, trying to find if there's an opening or someone canceled their reservation. So I could take it and all this. So one day I was lucky. So I got something at Yes Village. 
mm -hmm. which is just opposite the college, not far, uh, a stone throw from the college. Mm -hmm. So I stayed uh, at Yates Village for about six months or thereabout, and then I got where I am currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. And as I'm talking to you now, the accommodation crisis is getting worse. It is. Uh, yeah, it, it's getting more expensive. And it's not even about the cost, it's about finding it. Exactly. Even with your money, you can't you, you can find it. You, you're no. just going to be homeless. You yes, know? yes. You have to sleep in your car or something. So it's a serious problem. So uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a problem that was beyond my control. It was beyond the control of even my supervisor. There's nothing yes. they could do about yes. it. Yes. So yeah, it, it was. Would you have? Stressful. Do you have something or? like something to say or like a suggestion to give maybe that you think um, according to you might improve that situation like when as new students keep coming in we are just about to start the new um, academic year now like yeah. September is just like so close now yeah, yeah. so do you think that off the top of your head there is something that could be done to like you know at least control this crisis uh, even if it cannot be solved entirely uh, well um to me, I think um, maybe the government should look into it, you know, um, if there's a way to build more students uh, accommodation or something, mm -hmm. they should do that. Or maybe the university should invest into building hostel or something for Absolutely. students. Like we do in my country, for example, mm. and probably your country it's too. It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's always student accommodation, which is owned by the university in mm. my case. Yeah. So when you kind of get admitted mm. you don't have to go to the city trying to you know get where to live unless you want to you don't want the students accommodation mm. so I think it's, it's, an, op uh, it's an opportunity mm -hmm. that um, has presented itself mm. Mm. Uh, and uh, the university should probably look into you know either uh, liaison with uh, estate uh, developers and all Absolutely. this, yeah, so they can be able to come up with something. I, I see the university is trying to also kind of motivate landlords to you know enlist their properties mm. on the mm. school website, yes, so that uh, students can get something. Notwithstanding, uh, I still think. Um, a lot needs to be done, you know, a lot needs to and be done. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, I'd, I'd absolutely agree to that. Yeah. So it's a long way to go, but yeah. I think something more should be done at this point yeah. because yeah. of how the crisis is like putting it, its head up yeah. in front of us. So it's really affecting yeah. students because uh, in Sligo Accommodation, which is a Facebook group, you go there to look for mm -hmm. accommodation. I, I see students coming up there to write looking for accommodation. If they wouldn't find something, they're just going to have to defer the academic uh, section or much, yes, semester yes, and all yes. this. That's to tell you the level at which this thing is affecting the mental uh, stability and even the, the, the plan of a young person, you know, because of they probably have plan of trying to graduate in the next two, three, four years, but mm. because of accommodation now, they're going to defer the whole academic session. So that it's is not something anybody will want to do. Of course, it's just impacting their life in a, in a very adverse fashion, I would say. 